Hey pal, and welcome to the Scuba Diving Disaster Iceberg Part 2. In today's iceberg, we're going to be going over tiers 3 and 4, so let's get into it. So first off, I want to thank everybody for the feedback on Part 1. If there's one thing I want my viewers to know about this channel, it's that your voice is definitely going to be heard. Um, there were a couple of comments about the audio. So if you notice in this video, we have a serious audio upgrade. Uh, I went to an XLR mic. I got a HyperX, which I had been looking at for a while. I always used their gaming headsets when I was growing up. I really liked them and I got a way beefier amount. So hopefully there is a seriously noticeable audio upgrade to part two and continuing on. This video is going to be very similar to the last in that we're going to go over 10 stories, five from each tier. And each tier we go down, the stories get a little lesser known. If you guys are fans of scuba diving videos, reaction videos, and scary stories, then you should subscribe to this channel. So with all of that, let's get into part two of this iceberg. On December 24, 2014, Darren Spivy gifted his son, Dylan Sanchez, a set of scuba gear. Darren eagerly wanted to share his love of scuba diving with his son. Unfortunately, the place that he would pick for them to go on their first dive would cost them their lives. Eagle's Nest is a cave in Florida, and it's also known as the Mount Everest of cave diving. This is due to its massive room that could fit two Boeing 747s in it with ease, as well as the depth of the cave. With a name like the Mount Everest of cave diving, it attracts a lot of attention. In addition to that, just like Mount Everest itself, many people go there underprepared and get into trouble. On Christmas morning, the two excitedly headed out towards a different dive site, but found the area to be closed due to the holiday. It was at this time that Darren decided to take his son to Eagle's Nest. Located within a wildlife area a ways off the road, the entrance to Eagle's Nest is an ordinary looking pond with a set of stairs headed down to the water. On the drive-in, there's a large sign that reads, Cave diving in this area is extremely dangerous, even life-threatening. Do not dive unless you're a certified cave diver. In addition to that, every cave in Florida contains a plaque located underwater with a similar warning where the open water zone ends and the cave zone begins. Ignoring the warning, the pair put together their gear and went into the water. They began descending the narrow shaft and into the large main room. Once they reached the beginning of this main room, called the ballroom, they started to swim around until sunlight was no longer visible. As the narrow shaft is the only source of sunlight, they didn't have to swim far to reach an area like this. The room is so large that you can shine any powerful dive light in any direction and not see the wall. This room also contains a guideline, but obviously not every portion of that room has a guideline ran through it. One of the most important rules of cave diving is to never leave the guideline, and as Darren and Dylan weren't certified, they weren't aware of this golden rule. That underwater sign I mentioned earlier is at a depth of about 130 feet in this cave. This is the limit for recreational diving, and the risk of getting nitrogen narcosis while breathing regular air at and beyond this point is almost certain, adding another technical aspect to this dive. Hours later, when the mother didn't hear from her fiancé or son, she decided to drive to Eagle's Nest to look around. She found their car, but not the boys. Upon learning they weren't at the surface, she decided to call authorities who quickly descended on the scene and showed up with the technical diving rescue team. They were able to enter the cave shortly after and began by searching the ceiling of the ballroom, as that was a common place to find trapped divers. Shortly after, they found Dylan's body about six feet from the entrance of the ballroom with his mouthpiece out and no air left. They found Darren's body laying next to the warning sign at 130 feet in a similar condition. Their gauges both showed that they had gone down to 230 feet. On regular air, this most certainly induced nitrogen narcosis. This combined with the vastness of the cave and their inexperience led to their demise. Nine divers were exploring a sinkhole in May of 1973 in Australia known as the Shaft. Mount Gambier is located in South Australia and is a town of about 33,000 built on an ancient volcano. The limestone topography of the area makes for many caves, one of which is named the Shaft, located on land called Thompson's Paddock. 
The shaft sinkhole itself was discovered by a farmer in 1938 who shoveled tons of debris into the small opening to try and fill it. This was obviously unsuccessful, as unknown to him, the sinkhole was absolutely massive. Years later, the hole was explored as much as it could be, but the technology at the time had its limitations. In May of 1973, nine divers decided to expand on this exploration and map the entirety of the sinkhole. Due to all the debris from the farmer, the hole contained a large pile of rocks at a depth of 118 feet and then extended down in two different directions to a depth of 260 feet on one leg and 407 feet on the other leg. The divers began setting up equipment on the edge of the hole with the goal of finding the bottom, which had up to this point not been found. All of the divers within this group were dive instructors, but at this time in history, cave diving was in its infancy and there were not as many standards or certification in place as there are today. The divers planned to do a practice dive before their mapping run in order to get the lay of the land. On the 27th of May, they began this practice dive. They used a hoist to lower the divers into the water 20 feet below the surface of the hole and began their descent. On this day, they went down to about 200 feet breathing regular air and found that the hole shot off to the side in two different directions and got ready to explore the area the next day. The following day, one of the divers decided not to dive, so eight divers, John, Peter, Robert, Gordon, Larry, Glenn, Stephen, and Christine entered the water ready to explore. They dove down to approximately 180 feet when some of the divers began to get hit with nitrogen narcosis. It was at this time that things started to go quite wrong. Robert, who was feeling the effects hard, decided to head back, leaving seven divers in the cave. Glenn joined Robert shortly after, and then Larry, and then Peter. Peter had surfaced with pretty much no air in his tank, panicking and signaling to the other divers he hadn't seen the divers that were still in the water for quite a while. Down below, moments before, Peter had actually become lost, scattered with all of the others in the cave. Due to the commotion, the water had become heavily silted and the visibility dropped to near zero, and four people were still in the water at this time. Glenn, whose brother and sister were among those four, quickly descended back down to search for them. He came across a flashlight, a camera, and heavily silted water. He bravely tried to enter the silted water but quickly turned back. Peter also attempted a rescue but had no luck finding any of the divers. The following day, authorities arrived on scene to recover the missing divers. After searching and reaching a depth of 200 feet, the authorities called off their search as this mission was beyond their capabilities. Months later, a film crew was diving the cave and came across the body of Steven. They stopped filming immediately and informed police who were able to recover his body, but not the other three. Months later, the owners of the land decided to employ a more experienced dive team to recover the bodies. These recovery divers found Christine and Gordon at a depth of 180 feet. They found the body of John at 200 feet and recovered his body a few months later due to the technical nature of that recovery. It was thought that the divers ran out of air after becoming lost in the low visibility combined with heavy nitrogen narcosis. In 1991, an elite group of cave divers planned to explore the Indian Springs cave system located in Florida. Indian Springs is located in the Woodhill Karst Plain, which is an area with heavy limestone deposits causing many different features, including caves. Within Wakulla County, Indian Springs Cave reaches a depth of 300 feet and is at least 2 miles long. The elite divers plan to explore this cave in November of 1991 with a goal of mapping unknown passages. The group was highly trained and was using special gas mixtures per proper protocols for an expedition of this scope. George Irvine, who had over a thousand technical dives, was among this elite group. This was his first dive with a team of this size and reputation. They had three teams, one to place the first set of stage bottles, one to place the second set of stage bottles, and the third team consisting of Parker Turner and Bill Gavin who would perform the exploration. On November 17, 1991, the teams prepped their gear and entered the water. The first two teams performed their duties of setting stage bottles, and the third team jumped in behind them. The dive was set to be approximately two hours long. At this time, due to its popularity, the cave had permanent guidelines set throughout most of the passages, making the job much easier for the team. At about 63 minutes into the dive, the exploration team was exploring the Wakulla room when they decided to head back. On the way back, Bill and Parker were approximately 500 feet from the entrance and were on schedule. They noticed that at this point the visibility had suddenly decreased and by a significant amount. They stuck to their training and held the line, swimming along, where they reached an area called Squaw's Restriction. At this restriction, they encountered nothing but a pile of sand. The area of Squaw's Restriction, their only way out, had collapsed. 
This was potentially due to the exhaust gases from the divers causing air pockets on the ceiling, leading to a loss of support within the cave. Bill stuck to his training and tied a line to the main line and began searching around. They both began to doubt that they were actually in the proper location, but they were sure, and it finally dawned on them what had happened. The two were quickly running out of gas, writing to each other frantically on their slates, asking each other what to do. They continued to search and search, and then they got separated. Bill, nearly completely out of air, finally found a narrow opening and raced up to his stage bottle, narrowly surviving. Bill also noticed Parker's stage equipment at this time, unused, and realized that he didn't make it. Bill continued to sit and decompress, knowing that his friend was gone. The support divers began communicating and knew something was wrong, so one of them re-entered the water to find the pair. They came across Bill, who was acting incredibly weird. The support diver finally came across Bill's slate, which read, Parker is dead, and it dawned on him why Bill was acting so odd. For the rest of the dive, the support divers had to assist Bill all the way to the surface. One of the support divers re-entered the water to recover Parker. Authorities had also descended on the scene to assist in the recovery. The team planned to return the following day to complete the task. The following morning, the police had entered the water before the team had gotten there and recovered Parker's body. Parker had actually found the small opening before Bill and had taken off his gear to squeeze through. This led to his death, but it also had opened up the restriction enough for Bill to squeeze through a short while later, thus saving his life. On February 8, 1991, while the USS Ferris, an American Knox-class frigate, was docked at the Madeira Islands for a port visit, a diving accident occurred involving multiple Canadian Navy divers. During a routine hull inspection of the ship, the divers experienced difficulties leading to a tragic outcome. On this day, a ship from the Canadian Navy pulled into port and the dive team was asked to do a hull search of their own ship and the USS Ferris. The crew had done this inspection before on both ships. They began with their own ship and moved on to the Ferris. Due to both ships running on large generators, there was a lot of noise underwater and the divers could not tell that there was additional equipment that was still turned on. About two-thirds of the way up the Ferris, Master Seaman Hines was suddenly sucked up against the hull of the ship. Lieutenant Wells and left-handed commander Roland Lee went up to assist Hines and were also sucked up right against the hull. The main circulation pump for the entire ship was not turned off, causing the machinery to be on and active while the divers were in the water. The pressure was so great on the three divers that none of them could move whatsoever. Roland resorted to his training, which instantly snapped into his head, where he remembered that his instructor told him to always keep his regulator in his mouth, no matter what. Upon being sucked up against the ship, Roland was completely focused on keeping his regulator in and fought the current every second to do so. Roland tried to take out his knife and cut himself free from his lines that got sucked up into the intake, but lost his grip. He saw Hines still had his regulator in, but the other did not. A fourth diver who was not trapped on the ship began buddy breathing with Lieutenant Wells. This fourth diver made the extremely difficult decision to stop buddy breathing and bolt to the surface to yell for help and then rapidly descend to begin buddy breathing again. Once this happened, the boat above alerted everyone on sight and the crew jumped into action. After that, the fourth diver descended again to buddy breathe with Wells, but unfortunately, it was too late. The standby diver began trying to pull Roland off, but was unsuccessful. Through this, Roland remained calm. Finally, the circulation pump was shut down, and the support divers pulled Wells and Hines to the surface, while Roland successfully ascended by himself. By the time Roland reached the surface, he only had 200 PSI left in his tank. Both Lieutenant Corey Wells and Master Seaman Billy Hines sadly passed away from this incident. The chief engineer of the USS Ferris was court-martialed as a result of this ordeal. The Biford Dolphin accident is perhaps one of the most tragic and gruesome diving-related incidents in modern history. Six saturation divers met their untimely demise in just a fraction of a second. These divers were working on the Biford Dolphin oil rig, supplied by Dolphin Drilling, located in Norway, at a drill site with a depth of approximately 328 feet. The dive team on the Biford Dolphin was composed of six divers. Because of the depth at the work site, the dive team was working within a pressurized system specifically made for jobs like this. 
The system is comprised of a dive bell, pressurized to an equivalent depth of 328 feet at all times, which is raised and lowered into the water. At the end of the workday, this bell is raised up and connected to a living quarters that's also pressurized to 328 feet. Once these two units are joined together and the pressure is equalized, the door between the two can be opened and the crew can enter the living quarters. On November 5th, 1993, these six divers began their workday as normal. Two of the divers were returning from the bottom of the sea with the bell and they began standard procedures to dock to the living quarters. They locked all hatch doors in place and equalized the pressure to the living quarters. During this procedure, unbeknownst to the crew, the hatch had not properly sealed. This led to the quarters, which was pressurized at 10 times the normal atmospheric pressure to immediately meet air that was only at one atmosphere. This caused a violent depressurization that led to a phenomenon called explosive decompression. Within a split second, four divers within the habitat were dead, one diver outside of one of the doors was killed, and the other was seriously injured. Shortly after, that last diver passed away. The divers passed away instantly and painlessly, though the events of that day will forever be remembered by everyone working on the Bifurd Dolphin. In 2001, two brand new divers met an untimely fate in the Royal Springs cave system. Cave diving requires a significant amount of training. Instructors and organizations may vary with their requirements, but generally, someone will take an open water class, complete 25 to 50 dives, then take an advanced open water class, and after that, they'll usually complete at least 100 or more dives before taking cavern and cave classes. This whole path generally includes years of regular diving in multiple environments before taking any type of cave training. This is because cave diving is a completely different world than open water or even technical diving in other environments. The training requirements also ensure the cave divers are able to perform their dive safely and go home at the end of the day. Located in Suwannee County, Florida, Royal Springs Park is a well-known spring for swimmers and divers. The spring is generally about 42 feet deep depending on the season. On February 18, 2001, Mark Granger and William Reidenhauer went for a dive in Royal Springs around 4.30 p.m. with their diving instructor and one other buddy. They were both brand new divers and had planned just to dive within the pool, known as the open water area, and not enter the cave system. The group of four entered the water and began to explore around the pool. The instructor was having trouble equalizing and had become distracted while his buddy stayed with him to assist, but Mark and William continued on. Because of this, the group ended up getting separated, with Mark and William finding a cave entrance within the pool and choosing to enter it. They were completely untrained and underprepared, which quickly led them to kick up tons of silt and reduce the visibility to absolute zero. The instructor and diving partner eventually cleared their issues and were able to descend where they found the cave entrance. The instructor told his buddy to wait at the entrance while he entered the cave to look for the others. He only dove a short distance into the cave before turning back, after which the two surfaced and called for help. The instructor then got back into the water to look near the entrance again. He stayed near the entrance for about 45 minutes, hoping for them to return, but they never did. After the instructor surfaced again, a rescue diver was geared up by that time and had entered the water to begin his search. The diver entered the cave to search and a short while later, others arrived on scene to assist. After a lengthy search, the team exited the cave that day due to safety concerns and returned the following day. That next day, the team re-entered the cave to resume the search, finding new signs that the missing divers had been in the area. After entering a side tunnel about 492 feet from the entrance, the divers came across Mark's body. They continued and at approximately 530 feet in, at the end of that side tunnel, they found William's body. Both divers did not have the regulators in their mouth and they had run out of air. On August 18, 2010, Ben McDaniel disappeared within the Vortex Cave and sparked one of the most puzzling diving disappearances known today. On Wednesday, August 18, Ben went for a dive during the day at Vortex Spring. As he was not cave certified, he would only dive within the cavern zone during this dive. Later, during an investigation, other divers said that they had seen him looking closely at the gate that guarded the cave zone. As there are many caves in Florida and hefty training requirements to navigate them safely, some caves have metal gates blocking divers from entering past a certain distance. 
Many of the caves in Florida have an area that is quite open near the entrance and continue into a decently sized cavern zone in which light is still visible. Once sunlight can no longer be seen from the water, this is generally the determination for where the cave zone begins and gates can be placed. At Vortex Springs specifically, the dive shop on site holds the key to this gate where divers can show their certifications to gain access to the area. After Ben returned from this exploratory dive, he went into the shop to fill his tanks, which was caught by security cameras. He hung around on land near the entrance of the spring for quite a while. After his disappearance, it was noted by witnesses that Ben at that time looked like he was prepping for another dive that day. At 7.30pm, he called his mom and then entered the water. Two dive employees were also in the water and noticed he had a helmet on and lights with him. It's suspected that at this time, one of the employees allowed him to gain access to the cave area by letting him through the gate. Ben was never seen again. Several search teams including prominent figures like Ed Sorensen would launch multiple searches throughout the cave system over the next few years and come up completely empty. Ben's parents even offered a reward for the return of their son, but after the death of another search diver, the diving community pressured the parents to take down the reward as it was thought that the motivation was putting unexperienced divers in danger. Ben was going through a very rough time at that point in his life and had lost his brother and his business. Many theories on his disappearance were given. One of the theories was that he had done this purposefully, as he was going through quite a lot at the time. Another theory is that he had not died in the cave that night, as he had never been found, even after several extensive searches. The dive shop owner had a very shady history and had been arrested for assaulting someone with a baseball bat on the property, and it's thought by some that he had something to do with Ben's disappearance. Until someone who knows something comes forward or anything is found of Ben, which is unlikely to happen at this point, we will never know what truly happened to him. Hutchinson Island is a beautiful strip of land called a barrier island. The area contains beautiful beaches, businesses, and residential buildings. Off the coast of the island, there is a large yellow buoy floating on the surface of the water that marks three large man-made pillars just underneath the surface. The structure under the water is massive and resembles a building, making it an interesting area to scuba dive. In July 2015, Chris and Robert were out with their families and decided to scuba dive in this area after coming across the unmarked buoy and noticing the large structure under the water. Curious, the two suited up and entered the water. They soon came across a massive building-like structure just beneath the surface and began to explore. They swam towards the structure and then swam towards what looked to be an opening of one of the pillars. Eventually, Chris started to feel a current pulling him in towards the pillar, and before he could do anything, the current was already far too strong. He was quickly pulled into the structure and suddenly found himself in complete darkness. Robert was lucky enough to not be pulled in, but had watched the whole ordeal and began to panic big time. He quickly swam to the surface and alerted the others about what had just happened. Robert had to repeat himself to the group as Chris's wife thought he was playing a cruel joke, but unfortunately, this was all too real. Chris, meanwhile, was in complete darkness, tumbling around in the water, completely unaware of his fate. The current was extremely strong and trying to pull his regulator out of his mouth, but he fought to keep everything put together. He had a dive light with him and managed to grab it and turn it on, but it didn't reveal much. The pipe was so long that he was not able to see anything past a certain distance. He worried that he was headed towards some sort of machinery like a turbine that was causing all of this current, and quickly began to think about his impending end. He stated later that during that time, he even thought about removing his regulator and drowning to avoid being chopped up by the massive blades of the possible turbine at the end of this tunnel. Minutes passed and suddenly a small light appeared at the end of the tunnel, and he was quickly whisked into a large pool of crystal clear water where he could see daylight at the surface. He truly thought that he was dead at this point, but quickly snapped back to reality when he saw all of the sea life. All around Chris were huge cement structures leading out of the water, and it had finally dawned on him what had just happened. He was sucked into the reservoir of a huge nuclear power plant. The yellow buoy at the surface had marked the intake of this reservoir. The pipe that Chris had been sucked into has a flow rate of 500,000 gallons every minute. He escaped the much weaker current and exited the water. He soon came across a plant worker who was completely shocked at what had just happened. Chris then borrowed his phone and called his wife to let her know that he was alright. Chris then ended up suing the power plant as the buoy had not been marked nor was there any protection on the intake. 
During this case, it was unearthed that actually in 1989, another person had been sucked into the exact same intake. Luke grew up as a kid who loved adventuring and taking bigger risks. He also had a love for scuba diving and naturally grew into the profession of underwater welding when he was about 34. Five years later, he moved to Nova Scotia, Canada and took a fresh job there. One day, he was getting ready to perform a routine inspection of a sluice gate. A sluice gate is a component of a tidal power plant used to control the flow of water into the turbines. Due to the area having some of the highest tides on the planet, Nova Scotia is a perfect place to put one of these power plants. His task that day was to inspect the gate to make sure it was functioning properly and didn't need any service. He donned his dive gear and hopped into the frigid waters. As he was diving with commercial dive gear, he was diving on surface supplied air, which is brought to him by an umbilical cord. The cord can be used as a line of simple communication, so shortly into his dive, his surface workers felt the tug of the umbilical cord signaling that Luke wanted to be pulled up to the surface. Shortly after the signal, the surface workers felt the line go completely taut and it wouldn't budge at all. All the workers could do at this point was tie off the line to ensure Luke didn't get pulled in any more than he already was. The workers that day had made a fatal mistake and forgot to perform a simple test for current. The team would release a small bag into the water and watch its trajectory, which would help confirm if the sluice gates were fully closed or not. At the time of the dive, that sluice gate was actually open about a foot. It suddenly dawned on the workers that Luke was now being pulled into the gate by the colossal amount of water attempting to flow into the plant. They were forced to sit and wait for another hour for the tide to calm down, at which time they were able to send divers into the water. Shortly after entering the water, they found Luke's body wedged into the one foot opening of the gate. Because of the large amount of current produced by the gate at the time, Luke's regulator and helmet had become dislodged and he drowned shortly after. Bonnie Cotier was one of the most skilled cave explorers of her time and a renowned member of the cave diving community, but met an untimely end when exploring a Welsh underwater cave system. Palakum Cave Complex is a very difficult cave dive to access within the Clitic Gorge and contains a significant dry caving portion before the water even begins. The cave contains numerous tight passages and is well known to silt out very easily. Because of these factors and how remote the site is, divers don't visit the area often. The entrance to the cave is located inconspicuously underneath a rock on a small ledge and is only the size of an average human. This leads into the dry portion of the cave, which includes rappels and crawls to get to the wet portion. On April 23, 2011, Bonnie, Duncan, and Martin decided to take on this challenging cave system as Duncan was performing research at that site that day. The three decided to go on a dive of about 45 minutes, geared up, and set off for the site. They entered the cave and fought the restrictions with their dive gear to enter the wet portion. Martin and Bonnie were going to help Duncan with his research by taking photos of a certain restriction located within the cave. Duncan ended up going further than Martin and Bonnie to complete his research and mapping. Bonnie attached a line to the main guideline, called a jump, in order to enter through a restriction and explore that portion of the cave system. About 45 minutes into the dive, Bonnie hadn't returned to the rendezvous point which immediately alerted Martin, who was running low on air at this point. He began his search for Bonnie where she had tied her jump and found her alive and began to assist her. Bonnie ended up breaking away from Martin in the commotion and actually started swimming in the wrong direction. Martin, who was nearly out of air at this point, was forced to surface and call for help. He called on a friend to bring extra cylinders of air out to the dive site so he could continue his search. Duncan ended up going in to search once the extra air arrived and quickly came across her body hanging vertically in the water, out of air. The dive line was tied around her waist and partially cut, possibly suggesting that she had become entangled. An autopsy report determined that Bonnie had passed away from drowning. Well, thanks to all eight or nine of you for joining me until the end. I really hope you guys enjoyed the video and join us next time for part three of the iceberg or I'm going to be going diving in the river looking for treasure. Not sure which video is going to come out first, but they will both be coming out very soon. With that, we'll see you guys later. Thank you.